to the University of Reading. Welcome to our Fair Trade Lecture. Uh, I am the uh, head of the Department of Economics, James Reed. Um, this is an event put on jointly between the Department of Economics and the chaplaincy here at the University of Reading. Uh, and we're delighted to have uh, the CEO of Cafe de Lac, John Steele, uh, here to give us the, just the Fair Trade Lecture today. You might instinctively think that the uh, collaboration between the Department of Economics and the chaplaincy is a little bit of a strange one at first glance, perhaps. But I'd like to encourage you, the Christian and the economist, that it's anything but that. Um, both economists uh, and Christians uh, look upon the world and look upon the way in which the world works. Uh, we, we study and we analyze the way in which people uh, do things, uh, go about things, what kinds of mechanisms lead to particular kinds of outcomes. Economists are often um, described as being in favor of free trade. Uh, that is free trade and market forces and how the market leads to particular uh, outcomes occurs. I'd like to say that's a quite a, uh, an unfair description uh, of economists, but tonight isn't about me necessarily giving you a lecture uh, on what economists say. We're delighted to have uh, John with us as the CEO of Cafe de Lux, uh, someone right at the heart of that fair trade movement. Uh, and so my job isn't to sit here and talk to you any longer uh, about this, but to let him uh, get going. Mark, uh, John is going to talk to us for uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, and uh, at any point, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to, to, to interrupt. And there will be time at the end both for questions and also to go back and have a look at the, uh, the fantastic stalls out in the foyer. So without any further ado, I'm going to let uh, John take it away. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, James, for your kind introduction. I mean, why would you go to, to somewhere where lecturers lecture for their job and you don't, and risk standing in front of 65 people? They're quite astonishing, really, but I'm here, and uh, um, you probably get lectures from professionals all the time, but we'll have a go ourselves. Um, so, as James said, I, I'm the CEO of Cafe Direct. Um, I've, been, I've been running the company for eight years, and... Uh, I, I very much want to have a conversation with you, so please, please, as James indicated, please do ask questions at any stage. Just put your hand up and I'll ask me questions, because otherwise I'll be just clicking PowerPoint slide after PowerPoint slide. I mean, I, if you've seen something click 500 times, that is not what you want. So please, please do ask questions as we go along. Um, for tonight's lecture, I've tried to structure it into a, a number of components. So we're sort of in the introduction at the moment. Um, then, it is a fair trade lecture, so I want to talk a little bit about fair trade, about what it, what it is and its impact, and also the contribution that all of you and the UK has made to fair trade, because you know, the UK is by far the biggest market in the world, and you know, as a population, it is, you know, the UK is incredible, many parts of the world are a long way behind and trying to catch up. So, and that, that is down to the community of this country. Got a question already? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. No, that's great. It's probably a bit pedantic, but I'm an engineer and I'm an animal But is that, that we've only read about how many different plants, yeah. is that per just totally business, or does it per head of population, or? Uh, all of those things. I, mean, all of that, I don't know the detail well. well. It's certainly the biggest market in absolute terms. I mean, so I think it's over a billion sterling. And most markets are nowhere near that. So, you know, it's 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 actually. I don't you know. Do I know the reasons? I mean, my my view would be that the fair trade movement in the UK has really tapped into community. And I think if you look at fair trade towns, you look at fair trade universities, and you look at the a lot of it to do with the Church of England role as well in society. But if you look at it over time, I think it's really embedded on the ground. Whilst I think in many countries it's more just sold as a label. Um, keep those questions coming, um, although we'll have to stop at 7.30. Um, so a little bit, of a, a bit, bit about fair trade. And I want to talk a little bit, little bit about the company that I look after, Cafe Direct. And I, I want to do that not only because we're 100% committed to fair trade, because, but also because I wanted to give you a feel for the kind of business we have, our purpose, the way we go about trying to improve people's lives and the planet we're all living on. So that's to kind of broaden the conversation a little bit beyond 
bad faith itself. And then after I've talked a little bit about the story of Cafe Direct to go into how we, we ma maximize impact and to do that I'll talk a little bit about some of the examples on the, on the ground as well. So it's really, you know, introduction, fair trade, Cafe Direct, impact um, for the business and then how it works with farmers. Um, although there's a bit of question and answers at the end, by all means let's get them all absorbed as we go along. Okay? Um, so about fair trade. I mean, we are, I'm standing in a fair trade university in a fair trade town. Um, do we all know what fair trade is and does? Good. Well, I shall still remind you, so here we go. Um, these are some slides I got from my friends at the Fair Trade Foundation. Um, I, I am biased, but I think you know, fair trade does make a fundamental difference. Um, there are lots of discussions about it versus other certifications and other ways of doing business. But um, fundamentally and importantly, there is an economic benefit. So if you're buying coffee, and you know, Cafe Direct does coffee, tea, and cocoa, but if you buy coffee, which is the, the second most traded commodity in the world behind oil, you can buy a pound of coffee on the New York Stock Exchange for between a sort of 88 cents and about $1.20, which is significantly below the cost to actually make a pound of coffee, but it's also significantly below the fair trade minimum price. So economically, if you're buying a fair trade product, you're already providing a farming community with a higher price than a non-fair trade product. Also, there are benefits to the way a cooperative is managed in terms of some of the, um, the structure and standards on farm. So also I think you're, you're helping to have more discipline on farm. Um, also, it's not just about minimum price, there's also a fair trade premium, which you may have heard about, which is an, an additional amount of money on top of the base price that goes to fair trade committees. So if you go to a co cooperative of say 300 farming families, those families will come together and they'll have a small committee of people who will take that premium and they'll decide what to do with that in the best interest of the community and the environment they work in. So not only does fair trade provide a minimum price, but it provides an amount of money to have impact both socially and environmentally on the communities in which they, they operate. Um, so you know, fair trade as a certification is a good, strong, probably the best, I mean, I think the best in class social certification because you know no other certification that you can buy has a minimum price or money earmarked to make specific changes <coughs> um, what else do we know about fair trade um, certainly if you talk to farmers about it without it they will be not as well off um, and I think a lot of that is down to the strength of the mark and the charity, you know, the Fair Trade Foundation behind that, and to all of your behaviour. So as I said at the, the outset, you know, the UK is a, a quite astounding market for fair trade. And, you know, in the UK, awareness of the mark is, you know, up at 90 odd percent, um, and it's running across coffee, tea, cocoa, bananas. Um, so be careful about this, but, you know, diamonds and gold for those that, you know, a bit more, um, and a whole range of, of products and commodities. Now, to be fair, although I think the UK has done brilliantly, a lot of those commodities are still primarily not fair trade. So tea is down to about 1% of the UK tea is on fair trade tea, which is quite absolutely shocking, really. Um, I think um, you know, the co-op is incredibly committed to fair trade tea, as are we, but a lot of the main brands are operating on Rainforest Alliance. Um, coffee is only about 27, 28%, whilst I think you all think fair trade coffee is, is you know, a dominant kind of force. Um, but um, I think um, all of you, are, I think, already believe that if you're buying fair trade, at least you know you're doing the best you can. So, um, any, any questions about fair trade? Yeah, there's one here and then some more there. So I'll just you mentioned Rainforest Alliance, I'm just compared. I mean, so Rainforest Alliance is primarily an environmental standard. Um, 
I don't know a lot about it, to be fair, um, but it's primarily an environmental standard. It doesn't have a min minimum price um, or a premium, um, but from a standard point of view, it has things on farm that need to be done to look after the environment. Um, I guess, you know, um, I, 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 I have a slight frustration with competing schemes because I think it, it's com com confusing for consumers and really we ought to be able to navigate the products we buy and the businesses we buy from with more clarity. So I think um, you know, in a way it's not helpful having lots of competing certifications, but um, it's primarily an environmental standard, whilst I suppose fair trade is primarily a social standard. Yeah, so there were two more, maybe three now. Exactly. So it is. It is a broader standard that you know is a, is a social and environmental standard together. Yeah. And yeah, you had a question over here. Oh yeah. So if you take a, um, a bag of coffee like we've got at the front, yeah. Uh, what proportion of the retail price will actually go to the producer Ooh. of coffee beans? Oh, that is a good question, and I don't I think, think I know I the answer. Got a bag, a big bag of Nissan Saro range, which does that. So Ooh. Yeah, bring it in. Let's do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've got I've got a chart that shows kind of the difference between the fair trade price, the premium, and everything else per pound. And I don't have to hand a, a document that has that. But I, I will have that because we're part of a, a global <coughs> transparency movement where you can go onto their website and see the amount of pence <coughs> per bag from a supermarket that goes across. Um, <coughs> no, I'm not going to try and guess it. That's what you want. Well, I need to get my glasses on. <laughs> this is multimedia now. Um, <coughs> yeah, so that is very similar to what I've already said. So they're saying one thirty-two, one pound thirty-two a bag, which um, is pretty good. Um, th on this, they're saying the RRP for their analysis is four ninety-five, um, but certainly. I think for, yeah, which if you compare it to a non-fair trade product is, is a really significant difference. Um, I, think, I think on the Transparency Guide, which is a US website that we're on, it's about 130, 127, 132, around that kind of level. Um, I think, um, I mean, what, what Tradecraft are doing, and Tradecraft is one of the founders of Capital is great, because um, one of my passions is get, being transparent about price. And I think one of my hopes is with technology, we'll be able to just look and see exactly what you get from each of them, because um, we, we should know, shouldn't we? Um, so there you go. A great question. Great answer. Right here. <laughs> There's one starting. Yeah. Great sales lady. Um, oh, can I just get this lady? Yeah. Come yeah. Back? Yeah. was asking for questions, <laughs> which is great. Um, I mean, as a, as a brand owner, you do get audited. So you, you, know, you get audited to make sure that you are buying on the right terms with the right payment. Um, um, so we, we get audited. I'm trying to think what else would come into the audit. So for us, it's not, too, it's not too complicated. And you have to demonstrate that you're paying the fair trade price on your purchases and that you're paying the premium. So you have to do that. And you have to be getting it from a fair trade certified farm. So that's kind of for the brand owner. So in a, in a way, for the brand owner, the biggest thing is that you have to make sure you're paying that amount of money and the premium, um, which I think is one of the reasons that some people do and some people don't, because it's quite a significant amount. For the farmer, you have a large amount of, of audit. Um, and I don't know the, the, the specifics on that as well, but I think when you've got a farm where a very low percentage of their crop is on fair trade terms, it must be really challenging if you've got to go through an audit and you've got to be quite precise and you've got to have cost attached to that and then a lot of your buyers are buying on non-fair trade terms. So I, I do think the more we can help support fair trade, the more it helps farmers to be certified 
and to improve their, their incomes and their standards. So it's not straightforward. I mean, I've, I've certainly been to um, tea cooperatives where you know, they've seen their volumes come right down and they're having to do an audit for Rainforest Alliance, an audit for UTS, although UTS and Rainforest Alliance have now come together, and then fair trade. And it's all costing money and time. Um, so, yeah, no, there's, there's work to be done on both sides. So, and so we, we deal with, as a company, we, we deal with cooperatives, so organized structures of farmers together. Um, and so you, you're, you're buying from a cooperative and they <coughs> would then um, be certified in, uh, as a fair trade um, farm and they would certify their coffee. They'd have some that are non-certified. Um, so it's, 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 it's working at a cooperative level rather than just a farm, I suppose. Within that farm, there'll be some farmers who have different quality of product, and there'll be some within the farm that might have a part of that farm that is a, a different standard as well. So they might have a micro lot, which is a, you know, a specific kind of quality of coffee as well, which could be fair trade or, or not. My question kind of builds a little bit on her, because there's been pushback in the industry against fair trade for, well, it's not me saying it, but the reasons are, because it's an undue burden against farmers, and which basically boils down to a marketing ability for brands and retailers to sell more coffee while putting more un unnecessary burden on, onto the farmers. Yeah. And, and I wonder if you could address some of that, or if you have some thoughts on that. I mean, like, I think Sainsbury, is it, that dropped out of you? Yeah, so, so Saint, Saint Sainsbury's moved to fairly traded tea okay. as a trial, and it must be probably two years ago now, uh, where they wanted to look at managing the whole thing themselves and, and okay. having their own foundation. Um, I think, I think having a, a third party look at things is a good discipline um, in terms of having a third party certification body. Um, I'm not saying it's, it's perfect, but I do think for, for, for us in coffee at the moment where the coffee price is so far below the minimum, mm. if you ask any of our farmers or, or look at it, it's got to be worth it because you know, economically it's, it's so significant the difference. Now over time, those prices have changed. You know, the fair trade price is there, but the market price has moved up and down. Right. Um, but I think at the moment, and it's been like that probably for two years, that the, the, the conventional price is so far below the, the fair trade price that it works economically. Um, certainly some of the farmers we've talked to, without selling a percentage of their crop on fair trade terms, you know, it, it's a complete disaster because the price is so low on the conventional terms. So it off, you know, that, that's, that higher income on that part offsets the other part. But I guess if it was, if the pricing was closer together, then that pricing mechanic wouldn't be as, as fair. Yes. Yeah, but um, I so, think. So, in comparative their costs, what you're seeing is it would it still makes sense for them to, because of the price that they would be able to sell. De definitely in coffee. I think in tea, it's probably more challenging. Um, okay. You know, especially yeah. if you've got a tea cooperative that's got a very low percentage of tea, because the UK is the market that's very much about Rainforest Alliance tea. Um, we'll come back to any more questions in a while, but I'm going to try and get on to my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> it, was my, I, it was my responsibility, I'm the guy who said, let's do the questions, so. <laughs> which is great.